as a spy plane for the CIA in the 60s and designated the A-12. The Mach 3 Plus aircraft first flew in 1962, taken off from Groom Lake Air Base in Area 51. Later, once the Air Force took over the operation, it was designated the SR-71 Blackbird. My friend Chuck, an SR-71 pilot, related to me an in-flight incident he had in the 1970s. He was returning from a reconnaissance flight, was at an altitude of 74,000 feet and a speed of Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. He noticed something flickering in his, in his peripheral vision. Hovering over his left wingtip was a ball of dense plasma-like light. When he stared at it for more than a few seconds, it hurt his eyes. Chuck, Chuck tried to use his UHF, VHF, and HF communication sets to no avail. There was nothing but static. Repeatedly glancing <clears throat> at the ball of light, he watched in amazement as it moved effortlessly about his aircraft. At one point, the light positioned itself a few front feet in front of the spike cone of the air intake inlet. The enormous amount of air rushing <clears throat> excuse me, into the engines should have sucked in and shredded almost anything in its path, but the light orb was mysteriously unaffected. The light, he noted, acted in a curious manner, if something inanimate could act in a curious manner, or act in any manner at all. It moved from time to time to other parts of the aircraft, staying <clears throat> until its approach to Beale Air Force Base, California. It was inside of the air base when the plasma ball finally pulled away from the aircraft in a wide arc at ever-increasing speeds. Of course, after reading his incident report, his operations commander told him never to speak of this incident. When Chuck related the story to me, he was absolutely convinced this plasma ball was controlled by some form of intelligence. I have over two dozen stories from pilots of similar incidents with UFOs and plasma balls. Have you ever heard stories about missing memory? <clears throat> Sal worked a program for two years in a top secret research facility in California. At the end of the program, he started having flu-like symptoms. And after several days of worsening symptoms, went to his company doctor. His company prescribed some medication and sent him home for two days. On the third day, he woke up and couldn't remember where he worked or who he worked for. He called his brother. His brother, in a panic, called up the company. The company informed him that his job had been terminated because his contract had run out. Sal was the SR-71 pilot I spoke of earlier. To this day, and uh, I can't say to this day, I haven't heard from Sal in two years, the only thing he could ever reconstruct was from his pay records, letter of offer, and his personal notes, engineering notes, to convince him he actually had worked there. The company in question was involved in developing the TR-3B gravity disruption device called the magnetic field disruptor, which is the circular accelerator part of the TR-3B, which I'll go into more detail in a minute. Have any of you ever heard of this super, uh, excuse me, super strong foil-like material at Roswell? I'm sure most of you have heard something about it. Another friend who worked for General Dynamics in Fort Worth described a program in which he worked a plasma accelerator in the mid-60s researching gravity warping techniques. He is a physicist by education and trade. This was his first top secret program. <laughs> he described a foil-like material, <clears throat> much like that reported, discovered after Roswell crash. He described the foil as 12 layers of material less than 10 thousandths of an inch thick. It was as flexible as a plastic trash bag, but virtually indestructible to piercing, burning, or cutting, which you've probably all heard before. Here's what you haven't heard. In order to cut the material used for the project, the material was supercooled. A large electrical charge was applied to polarize the molecular structure and a laser cutter was applied in order to cut this material. Large ribbons of this material were used to reinforce the accelerator, which contained the mercury-based plasma that they started researching in 1965. The plasma was cooled to superconductive temperatures, rotated at 45,000 revolutions per minute, 
and pressurized at 150,000 atmospheres. This would be considered state-of-the-art technology even today, some 30 years after he worked the project. 33, okay. <laughs> yeah. He related that the project achieved its objective. Instruments and test objects placed within the center of the accelerator showed a 50% loss in weight attributed to the reduction in the gravitational field. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this technology when I address the TR3B and the magnetic field disruptor. From 1973 through 1976, I was home base at Edwards Air Force Base. It is near Lancaster, California, and even near the San Andreas Fault. <clears throat> Edwards has a long history of secret technology and experimental aircraft. It's a shame that's not clear. That's a B-2 stealth aircraft. It's a beautiful picture. The YB-49 was flown in 1948 at Edwards Air Force Base, which looks a lot like the B-2 stealth bomber. The XB-70 was first flown in 1964 and looks a lot like the new top secret SR-75 the Air Force says doesn't exist. Edwards is the home of the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School and is responsible for flight operational test and evaluation of the Air Force's newest aircraft. It hosts a number of tenant organizations including NASA and a Jet Propulsion Laboratory facility. I work the F-111 Swing Wing Bomber, the F-15 Air Superiority Fighter, the F-16 fighter, the A-10 close air support attack aircraft, and the B-1 stealth bomber. I was involved with these and other classified development product programs when they were just a gleam in some pilot trainee's eyes. One night, a longtime friend of mine and I were standing on top of the Fairchild A-10 hangar at Edwards Air Force Base. It was 2 a.m. in a perfectly clear night with millions of stars visible to the naked eye. This was a very common night at Edwards. I noticed a group of stars we were looking at was seemed to be shifting in color. And at the time, I, I could name quite a few constellations. I'd just taken a astrology course, and uh, I definitely knew what the Big Dipper was. I made a C, and I, I made a C in that course, I think, or a B. So I pointed out to my friend that the three stars near the Big Dipper in triangular formation, we're not supposed to be there. We watched as the strobing stars shifted in color to a, from a reddish yellow, I'm excuse, from a bright blue to a reddish yellow. After a period of about 20 minutes, we could tell that the objects weren't stars because they were getting larger. This was somewhat unnerving. It was further unnerving when the space in between the stars started blocking out the stars in the background. We decided it probably was a top secret Air Force vehicle of some type. Still, we weren't sure. Uh, at the time, I didn't believe in UFOs. And that's the honest truth. The vehicle had gone from half the size of the Big Dipper to twice its size in a half hour. It had moved from the west to the east towards Edwards Air Force Base. About that time, we could make out the silhouette or outline of the triangle. The lights are possibly exhaust, flared brighter, and vanished in an instant from the sky. This experience wasn't my first sighting, but it was one of the few where I had a witness. In the summer of 1976, I relocated to Nellis Air Force Base north of Las Vegas. I spent three and a half years there. I worked primarily with the F-15 electronics countermeasures and automatic test equipment. <clears throat> I'd heard rumors of air bases located in the desert at places called Mercury, Indian Springs, and others that didn't even have names at the time. Before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the USSR, no one talked about their classified work experiences, nor did we repeat rumors of top secret technology or aircraft. Most of us who had top, <clears throat> who had top secret clearances never even told our wives what programs we were working what we're, or where we were going. I once sp spent six months in Vietnam while my wife thought I was at a classified school in Denver, Colorado. The military in a court of law has actually denied the existence of classified Air Force Base inside the Nellis Range, out in the Nevada desert, within Area 51. Don't you know the plaintiffs and the lawyer were surprised to hear this? But that's another story. I was one of the few personnel at Nellis who had top secret 
clearance with crypto access and was certified on specific NSA cryptological equipment. I was certified on the Mode 4 IFF system for aircraft also, which uses encrypted codes. It was due to a combination of coincidence in my technical experience and my certification from, that I was requested to be temporarily assigned to a place which had no name. I was told by my commander to report to an office on the base. He didn't know where I was going to be working or how long I was going to be gone. And he was pretty ticked off at me because at the time we were fielding the F-15 electronics countermeasures equipment and it was critical. And uh, I think to this day he remembers that. <coughs> I left one month, the first mo Monday morning at 4.30 a.m. before sunrise. We boarded a blue Air Force bus with the windows blackened out. There were 28 other people on the bus on the first trip, including two security policemen with M16s and a bus driver. There was only one thing said to us for the whole trip. When we got on the bus, they told us, do not speak. And when the bus closed the doors, he repeated, do not speak unless you're spoken to. Well, if you ever had an M16 pointed in your direction, you don't talk. So we just, and it's, uh, it was pretty bad because the windows were, uh, you couldn't see anything. And eventually this fine silted dust started coming in the windows and you knew you were out in the desert. In the 1950s, the government started building the super secret Groom Lake facilities for the CIA's U-2 spy plane. It's located in the north central part of the Nellis Range and designated Area 51. Construction of facilities continues even to today, except mostly at Papoose and south of there. The SR-71, the TR-1, the F-117, and then a, can you back up one slide? Don't you know when it was really dark, a lot of people thought that was a UFO? Okay, next slide. And the B-2... That's not a B-2, that's an SR-75. We're tested at Grimm. Now the top secret SR... Back up just one for a second. Now the top secret SR-75, the SR-74, now next slide, and the TR-3B are operated there. Many of these aircraft have been misidentified as UFOs. When we reached Grimm, the bus had pulled into an aircraft and they shut the doors. The security policemen dispatched the regular workers to their jobs. I was escorted to the electronics building with a, sar <clears throat> with a sergeant who had an M16. I'm going to tell you something you've never heard before, and every person that comes after me that tells you they've worked at Grimm, I want you to ask them about this. Because no matter how much technology you work, or how many times you talk to people, you forget things. But you never forget discomfort. I was given a pair of hairy glasses to wear, which can only be described as looking like welder's goggles. There is no peripheral vision. They have polarized lenses. And anything past 30 feet is blurred. It's like looking through your shower glazed glass. If an M1 tank barrel had been pointing at me at 50 feet away, I wouldn't have had a clue. But I, that's exactly how they work. <clears throat> the whole time I was there, some 10 consecutive, day, consecutive days, first time, followed by numerous follow-up visits. The routine was the same. Leave Nellis Air Force Base before sunrise and return after dark. Only once did I get a glance at the whole base. They were getting ready to fly a classified prototype. 